Fox News alert, a showdown looming on Capitol Hill over the future of health care in our country. Some Senate Republicans now pushing a new strategy to finally end Obamacare, as they've been promising voters for years. This is Outnumbered. I'm Sandra Smith here today, Fox Business Network's Dagan McDowell, Democratic strategist and Fox News contributor Jessica Tarlov, former National Security Council staffer under Presidents Bush and Obama, Jillian Turner, and today's hashtag one lucky guy, the chairman of GOPAC and Republican strategist David Avella is here, and he is outnumbered, and wonderful to have you, sir. Happy Independence Day, ladies. Yeah. Thanks to everybody for yeah. being here, yeah. day before the 4th. Yeah, everybody on Friday was like, have a great long weekend. I'm like, what's going on? I was here twice yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> you, you Good were, for you. Yeah. All right, well, it's worth being here because there's a lot of Absolutely. news. Let's get to it. As the White House says, it remains confident a health care bill will make it to President Trump's desk this summer. Some Republican senators are now looking at the possibility of repealing Obamacare first and then replacing it later. Kentucky Senator Rand Paul, who's been critical of the current bill, says it's time to split it into two parts. Watch. I don't think we're getting anywhere with the bill we have. We're at an impasse. I think if you want conservative support, you split the bills. I think you can get almost every member of our caucus to vote for a clean repeal if there's a concurrent or simultaneous separate bill that includes some of the things that moderates want. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and other Republicans are so far rejecting the idea. And across the aisle, Senate Minority Whip Dick Durbin says Democrats will not help with health care reform unless Republicans take Obamacare's repeal off the table. Meantime, Democratic Senator Tom Carper says it's time for a reset. Watch. There's actually great value if you have introduced a bill. We have a time, some time to read it. We actually have a, a chance to hold hearings, to have discussions, to touch the CBO director and say what are the, the implications. Of, and if we could do that, if we go through that process and have a chance to offer some amendments in committees, we would end up with a much better plan. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel is live in Washington for us. Hey, Mike. Hi, Sandra. Yeah, one conservative senator told Fox today in, in order to get his vote, he wants to be sure this health care reform plan will help America's middle class. As it's written right now, I'm a no. I'm a no because uh, that bill does a whole lot for the insurance industry. That bill does a whole lot for the affluent. Uh, it brings about uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of tax reductions for the affluent. Uh, that bill has some provisions for the poor, but it leaves out the forgotten man and the forgotten woman. White House aides say President Trump has been having private conversations trying to help secure the 50 votes needed to pass this health care package. Aides say the health care proposal would help lower premium costs and would help provide better quality care for patients. One moderate Democrat says he'd like to talk to the president and Republicans about repair instead of repeal and replace. I'm the most centrist, moderate person they're going to find in the Senate that's willing to look down and sit down and work on anything in a more progressive manner that basically fixes the problems that we have. If they're not talking to me, if they're not saying, hey, Joe, what do you think, uh, you know, then they're not really reaching out. With Congress out of town for the Independence Day holiday, the Congressional Budget Office is analyzing a couple different versions of the Senate health care package. The president's point man on health care says he's hopeful the Senate will pass a bill gutting Obamacare soon. We think that uh, Leader McConnell and, and, uh, and his senators uh, within the Senate are, are working to try to get this piece of legislation on track. Uh, their conversations are ongoing as we speak, uh, and uh, so we look forward to hopefully uh, them coming back after this uh, Fourth of July uh, recess and, uh, and getting the work done. While some senators have started talking about Plan B on health care reform, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says his focus remains on simultaneous repeal and replace. Some GOP sources say if you're going to scrap Obamacare, you need to be able to tell your constituents how you will replace it. Sandra? Seems reasonable. All right, Mike Manuel, thank you. All right, so Dave, I can't wait to hear where you're <laughs> at with this. Because you are hearing from senators, some senators, as we just heard from out there, they're saying let's, let's, let's repeal first, replace later. The president has echoed that sentiment. It is a sound strategy because many Americans are going to be on their own with health care if Obamacare stays in place. People are already losing their insurance. You have increasingly this discussion about Medicaid is an interesting one given that many doctors are now no longer accepting new Medicaid patients. So you're what, in favor of what, it. What will those folks do? 
Here's what we know. Medic Obamacare is a disaster. Something has to be done to change it. Republicans are talking about it. And it was interesting to hear Joe Manchin talk about, uh, oh, we need to come together. Well, there are plenty of liberal and conservative health care experts who do agree that Medicaid needs to be given back to the states and let have them have more control. We could agree on that. And let me also, and I wrote about this last week on foxnews.com, Democrats who are up in 2018, like Joe Manchin, who President Trump won that state by 44 points. It is in his political interest to find, he ought to be knocking on Mitch McConnell's door saying, let me in, let me give you an idea so that I can vote for this. Dagan, it, 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 doesn't this give Democrats, a, 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 you know, the option of saying, hold on, you keep saying you campaigned on repeal and replace. Why wasn't there a plan to replace to begin with? You had seven years to put a plan to replace it um, in the works. And now they're struggling and fighting. And there are a lot of Republicans. Hey, Mike Lee and Bob Corker <laughs> and Senator Rounds and Marco Rubio, who sound like Democrats, who are like, hey, we're going to be the tax collectors for an entitlement isn't it state. fantastic? Now, I, they <laughs> are in favor. Let's call them out on what they're saying. They're in favor of keeping a tax increase in place on investment income. And they say it's for the rich. It's for middle class couples in many places at $250,000 a couple. That's to raise money. But again, if you repealed it, you would increase the capital stock. You would make capital formation better. You would raise wages. You would create jobs. One thing I want to add about the repeal, legislatively, it would be nearly impossible um, with a, a simple majority vote yeah. to do repeal and then replacement because you got to do it under budget reconciliation for 2017 and then 2018 leaves no room for tax well, reform. Let's, let's go back to the Democrats and put the ball back in their court because Chuck Schumer he said let, they should just quit what they're doing and let's let's work on a bipartisan plan yeah. here. How willing are Democrats really to work with Republicans on this? Well, I think they've hit the nail on the head there. There are a lot of Democrats who are in red states now. There's the Heidi Heitkamps of the world, Claire McCaskill, Joe Manchin. These are people who are up for reelection who need to do something, and their voters want them to work with Donald Trump and the Republicans. I have been heartened to hear that Chuck Schumer has been talking to Republicans about potential compromise. I think purchasing insurance across state lines is the way to go for Democrats on this, because we know free market competition will drive prices down and that's what everyone's complaining about. Wait, did you just my, say free market competition will drive I prices did. down? I did. That came out of my little liberal mouth right here on the eve of the 4th of July. Uh, I think that that's where we should start here. But I would say to the point about these seven years, there are actually Republican bills that have been put out there, namely the one from Susan Collins and Bob Cassidy that they did together that has a lot of smart ideas in it. Obviously, I don't like the totality of the bill, but it's not as if Republicans haven't been thinking about it. They just haven't gotten it together. And that is Mitch McConnell. Connell's fault. I mean, that's not a good leader. Hmm. Here's my problem with this. This is another example of Congress doing what it's best at, which is just kicking the can down the road. Everything looks rosy and amazing six months from now, but the problem is none of this stuff ever gets done. If I was the president, I would be looking at this and thinking, okay, let's kick kick the can down the road now till after the July 4th recess, then it's till after the August recess, then it's 2018. And the longer this takes to actually get through the Congress, the more stymied the rest of his. But what's the alternative, Joey? And just trying to pass something to pass something to, to meet the deadline? I mean, they have to face that reality. At a certain point, you have to face the music. We've, they've had all the time in the world. They have had since January. They've picked up like three votes. They really think they're going to get there in another month from now? All right, let's, Meanwhile, let's no one's put that in your lap. Uh, uh, why don't we, uh, to, to Jessica's point, why don't we look at free markets? Why don't we let individuals get back into making their health care decisions with their doctors? Part of this is all because Obamacare has put an enormous influence of the government into our health care system. Costs haven't gone down. Junk lawsuits aren't down. Doctors, we have a huge doctor shortage coming. None of this is being addressed, and quite frankly, it's not being addressed currently in the Republican right, bills. But, that's the but problem what there. we need to do is get away from a government dictating what should be insurance plans. Let's have many insurance companies put presenting many plans and let people pick the plan that works best for them. And then let's start addressing other issues I'm all that for are really impacted. Choice, but what are you going to do about, for instance, the 15 million people that are going to be kicked off Medicaid? I mean, that's what John Kasich, who's being called a liberal left, right, and center, is saying here. Which he deserves. Which, which is it's deserved. Fine for the, for that. It's you not as dirty of a you word do as you think that it is. You could do I mean, tax credits. I mean, there are many ways for many of those 15 million. But none and, of that is in any of these bills. And, and Jessica, that's the we've problem. Never, we, we've never addressed the fact that many of the folks who 
are going to become uninsured are people who don't want insurance. They're young folks who, who didn't have insurance in but the first the, place. And the only reason they took it was so they could avoid the tax penalties that Obama yeah, but how much? Yes, people will. The people who are on Medicaid today who got it under Obamacare wouldn't get it under these Republican bills. That's the whole point, that if you're able-bodied, that if you improve the insurance markets, then you should be able to go out there and buy cheaper plans on your own with government help. But that help. point is not it's being not sold with not very well. Medicaid. But Listen, to John Kasich's point, in his all-funds budget in the state of Ohio, 43% of that money, this is according to the Wall Street Journal, goes to Medicaid compared to 14% for K through 12 education. So let's make the point I'm of you what is your priority? Giving full-on government health insurance to able-bodied adults versus educating the next generations of children in this country. That's the choice that these so-called conservatives are making. All right, Dagan gets the last word on this. Fourth of July Eve, amid all the controversy over Russia, President Trump set to meet with President President Vladimir Putin for the first time on the sidelines of this week's G20 summit. What the leader of the free world should say to the man who meddled in our elections. And the president not letting up on the media, tweeting out a video that's heating up the battle even more. Where it goes from here and how much it all really matters to the American people. The fake media tried to stop us from going to the White House. But I'm president, and they're not. The grudge match between President Trump and the mainstream media heating up. Fierce backlash from the press now after President Trump tweeted out a mock video to his followers yesterday. It shows him body slamming a man with a CNN logo edited onto his face. It's a doctored version of an old clip of Mr. Trump appearing at a professional <laughs> wrestling match. A White House Homeland Security advisor defending the tweet on one of the Sunday shows. Watch. You're in charge of Homeland Security there. Yep. That seems like a threat. Yeah, certainly not, though. I think that no one would perceive that as a threat. I hope they don't. But I do think that he's beaten up in a way uh, on on cable platforms that he has a right to, to respond to, and uh, he does that and, regularly. And, so. and you don't think that's a threat to anyone? You don't think that's sending a message, do that to the media, do that to CNN? No, I certainly don't. I don't think so. And I think that, importantly here, he's a genuine president expressing himself genuinely. And to be honest, I think that's why he was elected. He's the most genuine person, and the people that see politicians and then see him find him to be someone that they can understand and relate to. But a CNN commentator firing back at that advisor, saying President Trump is encouraging violence against reporters. Watch. I'm a CNN commentator. I think that is unacceptable. I think that is the president of the United States taking things way too far. It is an incitement to violence. He is going to get somebody killed in the media. Maybe that will stop him. I am disappointed beyond belief by the answer that the Homeland Security advisor just gave. What a wuss. What a wuss. You could see that he is seeding his principles. The couch will react to that in just a moment. Peter Ducey first is live in Bridgewater, New Jersey for us, near where the president is staying. Peter? Sandra, the president's allies are now calling out some of the hysterical, breathless coverage over the president's video that shows him body slamming and punching the CNN logo in a wrestling ring. And they're wondering why that clip of something that was scripted and staged has people so much more upset than something else that was recently scripted and staged. I find it interesting that uh you know, if, if there's a play in the park about Shakespeare and Donald Trump gets murdered on stage, that's okay. That's entertainment. But somehow pro wrestling is real. Uh, I mean, where else but in the media would their minds go there? But uh, I, I just think they're looking for a way to be offended, and they're going to find it no matter how irrational it is. And it's just wearing thin. This morning, counselor to the president, Kellyanne Conway, accused mainstream outlets of trying to interfere with the president as he tries to make his points. And Conway expressed frustration that widespread coverage of tweets is overshadowing coverage of other things happening, like the passage of Kate's Law on Friday. The long weekend of media criticism did continue on Twitter today, where the president wrote this, quote, at some point, the fake news will be forced to discuss our great jobs numbers, strong economy, success with ISIS, the border, and so much else. 
There have been questions about how tweets like that one are helping advance the president's legislative agenda. And as it turns out, Republicans in the Senate say the tweets aren't much of a distraction. Our focus cannot be on the tweet. Our focus has to be on that kitchen table family paying twenty, thirty, and forty thousand dollars for their premiums, wondering how they're going to make ends meet. Their child might be addicted to opioids. We in Washington, we in the country, cannot be focused on tweets. We have to be focused on answering that family's problems. And I get so frustrated when we get focused on tweets. Despite all of the tweets and posts about bad media coverage over the long weekend, White House aides said today the president has spent his time here in New Jersey, uh, has spent his time here in New Jersey preparing for the G20 summit, and he does plan to head back to Washington tonight. Sandra. All right, Peter Ducey, thank you for that. All right, the topic has been introduced. <laughs> 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 Jillian, you ha were having a response to Peter Ducey reminding our audience, uh, comparing this to yeah. the Shakespeare in the Park acting out of the assassination of President Trump mm -hmm. and the lack of outrage that we saw from the media then. Is that a fair comparison to so, hearing what we're hearing now? I had not thought of it until Peter pointed it out just now, and I thought, oh, he's right. But then I thought, it, but he's right major overreaction to one, underreaction to another, both are shows of violence, whatever that means. We can debate whether they are or not, but both include violence. Um, but they're not really fair comparisons to me, because I keep coming back to one is a play, it's part of, it's the art. They're, they have freedom to do things, right? One is a tweet from the President of the United States. I keep coming back to this idea that all of these things, whether they're an incitement to violence or not, are, I believe they are beneath the dignity of his office, but that's for him to decide, the President. But I also think that they should just be, like Mika Brzezinski and CNN should be so far below the President's radar that he doesn't even it doesn't even register. He has mm -hmm. so many important Digging. things to worry about and do on a daily basis that he doesn't know and he doesn't care. Uh, That's uh, my ideal world. Being from the South, just to correct you, professional wrestling is an art form. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm sorry, Vegan. Vegan, I'm, I apologize. And I, did, I apologize wholeheartedly. I did feel like on Saturday, July 1st, 2017, was the day our national sense of humor died, based on the reaction to that video. I, I disagree with many things that the president ha has tweeted and the language that he uses, but that was hilarious. And if you didn't laugh when you saw it, and then all of a sudden it turns into he's going to be responsible for violence on journalists. Right. These are people, where was the outrage when our own James Rosen, under the Obama administration, his communications were being tracked by the government. There was a subpoena for his email signed off on by the Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder. Where was all of the nonstop outrage over that, which is a great deal more insidious if you're concerned about the First Amendment? Well, we all know James but, Rosen on this couch. And right. we know he's a little bit subversive. So you can't really do that. <laughs> he was labeled a co-conspirator in that subpoena. The president is a fighter. It is what the Republican base has wanted for decades. Someone to take on the shenanigans of the left. To, to have been in his position where he ran a company, he had a media company that put on a very successful show, you may have heard of it, uh, The Apprentice, that he does it Amazing, he, right? under all of that, and he owns casino companies. With all the research he gets from there about what motivates people, what people are interested in, what people will pay attention to, the president knows what he's doing when he tweets these things out. Uh, now, Jessica, let me, Jessica, but let me add one last thing. Jessica's chomping at Let me add, add one last thing. I was so thing. moderate for you on the, the last block. <laughs> <laughs> it's all out it's door over now, now David. <laughs> for all of this outrage by the media, and for Anna Navarro to get on there and say what she says, is a complete misunderstanding and an idiocy that the media and the president have not gotten along since day one. Hmm. Thomas Jefferson owned newspapers to attack his political opponents. This, this Somehow this is all new, that the media and the president have never gotten along is a complete misunderstanding or lack of knowledge well, was, of the history of this country. It was country. like this during, um, during the 1930s. Right. It was just the flip side. Jessica, 
Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I mean, this is the president of the United States of America. I mean, I remember the good old days when President Obama used to be criticized because he wore a tan suit when people thought he should be in Navy. Or when he used or a selfie. Mom, right? How big did his butt look? <laughs> or that he used a selfie stick. Really, Jessica? That. There was outrage over these it things? Come on. A no, the selfie stick for the BuzzFeed yeah, interview that he was embarrassing the country because he was using a selfie stick for this joke interview in the White House. Now, Anna Navarro has never liked President Trump. That's been perfectly clear. Maybe that sounds extreme. But the idea that on the 4th of July weekend, the President of the United States of America is spending his time retweeting something like that, using his speech to veterans to criticize the media, which I will say, the media has been responsible for exposing many scandals that are going on actually at the VA. We need a free press to be going in there and unearthing these kinds of details. It was a local, it was a local, it was a local news reporter who uncovered the so Loretta Lynch still, tarmac meeting with but, Bill Clinton. But it's, it's still part of the press. Right, let Dave respond here. Towards them. It's what reporter hasn't gotten to cover the story they want to? What reporter's freedom of speech has been taken away? Not one You're by not these embarrassed tweets. by this. I mean, quite honestly, I, I respect you a lot, and I respect a lot of Republicans, and I think they're in a very difficult position because this is not the president in attitude or policy preference that they wanted. Jessica, to but, be honest with you, you know what? So I think you said you thought it was funny. I was on the air when this got tweeted out yeah. yesterday morning, and I know that a lot, for a lot of us sitting on set, our initial reaction wasn't necessarily that it was funny. But I think you get to that a little bit later <laughs> after you watch it again. But it was, wow, he's going for it. He clearly didn't think that the Mika tweet was overboard. It was what it told no, me. It was and he starter. was going to double down and he was going to go for it. We heard he was walking around the White House asking, taking the temperature, mm -hmm. what would you guys think? Yelling and at then, the TVs. And then he went and did this. Well, so I, clearly it's part of his strategy, but, and he sees this as his strategy working. Well, he didn't so, back so, I do agree with Jillian in the sense that I don't understand why he cares what this group of peacock preening, humorless, uh, self-involved, insecure, overeducated liberals, why they care what they, he, they and think And I about. think there is, the danger here is that it sucks, too. it sucks all the air out of the White House. And there are people there like Tom Bosser, the Homeland Security Advisor, who is forced to go on a Sunday show and respond to whether or not this incites violence. There are such a barrage of issues on the national security side here that need to be dealt with. And when you suck the air out of the administration and force all the top level folks to, 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 to go on the defense about this, that but his supporters are going to say you're not acknowledging he is getting done. What about the two major pieces of legislation that's just passed on immigration? You are spot on. But that is in a separate issue. Years. That is completely separate. That is an immigration. Right. What he is accomplishing is a separate issue from what this is preventing getting Dave, done. In 50 years, people aren't going to be judging Donald Trump off what, what his tweet said. Were Americans more secure? Were they more economically advantaged? That's what historians are going to look back on this time and decide. And under that record, getting rid of many of the executive orders of President Obama is a good thing. You look at some of the legislation that Congress is working on, whether it be tax reform or health care reform, which maybe today hasn't passed, but one day will get Hopefully. passed. But here we in the all next know that years. executive that, orders that is what, don't in and of themselves accomplish anything. Well, I think they require implementation friends. across the federal government. We can count those as policy accomplishments once they're actually well, implemented, I suspect and nothing these, has happened These wily yet. lawmakers who are members of the swamp are going to use Trump's tweeting and the way that he talks about the media as cover for not getting anything done. So they can just wash their hands of the American people and the, Ameri and the growth agenda and say, uh, it's his fault, when indeed it's not. It will lie but on But they're not. They're also responding to Americans. I mean, 71 percent of Americans in the new Fox News poll say that the tweets are hurting Trump's agenda. And a lot of his supporters are in that group. And what I would add is in all of this kind of war on cable news that he's taking on, Americans have a choice, right? You can watch Morning Joe or not. You can watch Fox and Friends or not. You can be watching you know, Chris Cuomo. But you can't turn Morning's off the Maria. president. Morning well, no one would turn that off. But <laughs> you can't turn off the president of the United States of America. And you shouldn't have to think that. You shouldn't have to be sitting around your kitchen table with your children and saying, I don't want them to see this tweet from him. I don't want them to see his press conference. And that's why it's beneath the dignity of the office. All right. I promised you last word. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. President Trump gearing up for his first sit down with Russia's President Vladimir Putin. How Mr. Trump should handle this high stakes meeting.
President Trump heading overseas later this week for the G20 summit in Hamburg, Germany, and likely to dominate the headlines there, the president's first face-to-face -face meeting with his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin. Of course, that comes amid multiple federal investigations into Russia's meddling in our election last year. And though it's not clear what will be on President Trump's agenda for that meeting, Democratic Senator Joe Manchin is offering some words of advice. Make sure Mr. Putin knows that America will not succeed. We will not take a step backwards, and we will not allow him to infiltrate and change who we are as a people, get involved in our political process, get involved in basically uh, telling the people that, uh, that uh, elected officials are not done legitimately. Jillian, can anything good come out of this meeting? Because again, it's going to be the optics. <laughs> well, it's going to be the optics of the the Democrats over and over and over again reading the body language oh, yeah. between these two men. I think so, um, but body light, optics aside, and even the invest the investigations aside for a second, there's some really hard work on the policy level that needs to be hammered out between these two. We've got serious disagreements with the Russians when it comes to foreign policy. We're at odds in the Syrian civil war. We back different sides. We are categorically opposed to their illegal occupation of Ukraine, which PS has been going on for three and a half years. We are all for NATO expansion, which the Russians are doing everything they can to prevent. I mean, these are the kinds of things that that's the work that needs to get done. Whether they get sidetracked by the investigations and all that kind of thing in this conversation, 50-50, I'd say. It could go either way. I'm sure someone's going to talk about it. Um, but there, my point being, there's some really important work to be done, and I hope that those issues get addressed between these two world leaders. Because It would be a matters. complete waste of a meeting if Donald Trump brings up to him potential meddling in the elections. We have yet to have see one credible piece of evidence that suggests that somehow Russia impacted this election that changed one vote. Despite all these investigations and all this talk of meddling, we have yet to see where anything they did influenced one vote in this last but election. If I might just push back, that maybe no votes were influenced, that's fine, but there is hardcore evidence that they attempted to interfere, at meaning you and know, they were fishing in electronic Russia, Russia and we know how voting propaganda works. I mean, propaganda, um, while it might not be that someone showed up to the poll and said, I have just changed my vote from Hillary Clinton to Donald Trump because I read this in her emails or whatever. We, we know what the purpose of propaganda meddling is. And we also know this isn't new. Historically, this is something that has happened, obviously, for generations. Uh, but I do think it would not be smart of him to not bring it up. And also, Donald Trump does better overseas. I mean, think about just a few weeks ago when he was on his Middle East trip. He got the most praise across all networks in basically every newspaper there he was. He got praise the... from you, Jessica. Ooh. Yeah, no, he did. I thought it was great. That was an accident. He... <laughs> no, I, it was real. It was... I'm a... I want him to do well because America succeeds if your president succeeds. And it is an opportunity for him to seem tough. Even his own supporters do okay. want him Okay, but what you tough. just said is very important, it, it, what it's going to seem. I mean, the optics are going to be huge here, whether right. you think mm -hmm. they should be or not. Will the media even pay attention to what is discussed or achieved during this meeting? Because they're going to be looking so closely at whether or not the president smiles or shakes his hand or what. Like how you long know, the handshake lasts. Right. I mean, is that going to become the big story that comes out of that? Probably it shouldn't. Um, but not. certainly that's going to be super But there are a lot of great analyzed. journalists who are out there and, you know, who are looking for the deep dive here, who, you know, are talking about the fact that, you know, the Russia sanctions bill passed 98 to nothing. I mean, that was a in, the Senate. in the Senate. And then yeah. there was the report that the White House was trying to water it down. I on the which House is side. complicated. But I mean, there are areas of compromise between Republicans and Democrats and actually sanctioning Russia and being tough with them is one of them. Uh, so I do hope the journalists will be paying and attention to that in the coverage. I, I agree with you that being saying something to Vladimir Putin about you're not messing with this country anymore. More. And whatever shenanigans were going on during our election, that is over under my presidency. And I think that to go back to our last topic, Trump's posture on Twitter is part of this, that I'm a tough guy, that I'm take no prisoners. I don't care who you are. So if you act a certain way against American journalists and then you don't act tough, 
face off face right. to face with Vladimir Putin, then he does have a problem. Mm -hmm. And it is the president's job and his role to rebuke the Russian leader for attempted meddling. That's not meaning that's not something mm -hmm. that happens at a lower level. That happens president to president. So that's why it's incumbent upon him to take a stand here. It's not going to happen like intelligence director to intelligence director right. or secretary of state to foreign secretary. This is really on the president. Mm -hmm. Final word there. The House Intelligence Committee setting its sights on Susan Rice as the former National Security Advisor agrees to testify on the unmasking of Trump associates caught up in surveillance. What are the odds that lawmakers finally get some answers? We'll debate. We are expecting fireworks on Capitol Hill sometime after the 4th of July. As former National Security Advisor Susan Rice has agreed to take the hot seat, she'll testify before the House Intelligence Committee about her alleged role in the unmasking of Trump associates caught up in U.S. surveillance during the 2016 campaign. No date yet for her testimony, but the former chairman of that committee says it's high time lawmakers finally get some answers. Remember, Senator Graham, um, Senator Rand Paul, they've asked the questions, uh, have we, you know, during the last presidential campaign, were we tracked, were we monitored, were we unmasked, and the intelligence com community has been unwilling to provide them with those answers. And so, uh, you know, this may not be an easy job for the House Intelligence Committee to get to the bottom of it, mm. because for some reason it appears the intelligence community has not been fully cooperative. Meantime, Rice is suggesting race and gender may be part of the reason she's come under fire lately. Congressman Hoekstra not buying that. I think that's total nonsense. This whole issue of the NSA monitoring Americans, this has been festering for, uh, for 10 to 12 years. Uh, you know, a number of senators and members of the House, uh, Senator Ron Wyden, you know, a couple of years ago famously asked the director of the National Intelligence, James Clapper, is there a, you know, is there a huge database of mass and, uh, you know, of Americans being monitored by the NSA? And the director of national intelligence came back and said, no, there's not. Mm -hmm. uh, it was later revealed that there was. So, no, this has been an ongoing issue, uh, regardless of who has been in various positions. All right. Well, you heard it there. I, I mean, it's time for some answers, right, Dave? It would be more news uh, out of Susan Rice if she actually took credit for or, or explained the actions and the words used during the Obama administration, because there's so much double talk that came out of that administration and so much redirection and so much blaming someone else that it's hard to All get All right, is this time different, though? Will we get some answers? No. That's it? That's oh. it. <laughs> well, first of all, I think she's, so she's testifying in, 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 in behind private. closed doors. So that significantly changes things? No. It, well, no, I mean, it means you're even, it's guaranteed that no one's going to get any answers. Well, she can, all you're going to have is feedback from the sitting senators. You're not even going to have a first-hand account. You'll have a first-hand account. You won't have, be able to watch her testimony. She can also, Susan Rice, use her job as national security director as cover for the unmasking. She can just simply say, it wasn't politically motivated. I was doing my job. If you're talking about a Samantha Powers, that's different. No, because she, I disagree, Jagan, okay. because the whole purpose of the hearing is to try and suss out her. When you unmask somebody's name in an intelligence document, there's a threshold you have to meet. The mm -hmm. threshold is clear. Is there an imminent national security issue at stake? Is there an imminent national security threat? So it's incumbent upon her to explain to the senators why in these cases she believed there was, and then they will decide, well, they'll make she, their own assessment. Because remember, she told Judy Woodruff in March that she knew nothing about the unmasking of Trump associates, and then Rice turned around um, and told MSNBC later, I leaked nothing to nobody, but she did admit that she sought out the identities of Trump associates who communicated with, th with foreigners. So she, there's been a lot of, as you said, double talk. All right, listen to this back and forth. Uh, Lynn, Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, demanding answers at this point, and you will hear him do so, on spying. He wants answers. Listen to this. If I'm talking to the Russian ambassador in the United States, apparently y'all are listening. I don't really mind if you're listening. I do mind if somebody can take that conversation and use it against me politically. Senator, we have that request from you, and we are pro pro Yeah, it's like months ago. So, like, am I ever going to get it in my lifetime? If there's anything in this country people are entitled to, 
it's entitled to at least an answer to their question. If I were you, I'd answer my question because he's mad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a little humor, but still, Senator Graham saying, I asked for this months ago. Where yeah. are you at on this? So uh, it's also a great reminder of how funny uh, Lindsey Graham was in the presidential debates. He does have a great Thank sense you. of humor. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, he sure was. Yes. Um, no, I, I think that he's spot on there, and I think this is actually somewhere where we can, again, have bipartisan agreement that there should be answers about this. If there is anything being done in terms of unmasking that is politically motivated, not what's legal and what's appropriate. If there's a real threat, people are doing that, uh, that's fine. But if it is being politically motivated, this is something that can happen under a Democrat administration or a Republican administration. And we should have answers to that. Obviously, Susan Rice testifying behind closed doors, we're not going to have big answers on that. Um, but I do think that she's complicating actually her own situation. And we were just talking about this in the break. And by kind of deflecting and saying this was an issue of sexism, or racism, I, I think moves us away from the fact that, first of all, there's a strong force of partisanship that's at play here, and I think that's more of a factor than racism or sexism, but that also she puts herself out there in the public eye, and, and I take the point that she needs to defend herself and the Obama administration, um, but there are a lot of people who are going to be looking just to pin everything on her and focus on that when there's an entire sideshow going on over here with Republicans, and it becomes a distraction. Well, but the way. reason can these progressive is... women stop using their gender as a crutch? and take some personal responsibility sure they for can as long as these conservative women don't deny the fact that there's systemic sexism and racism built into the system and that's the problem identity politics is complicated every absolutely time you get and i caught, think that it gets abused every time but it you doesn't get caught, mean that it's there is fault no. it's because i'm a woman no it, it's not every time, absolutely. And I just offered that up I about know. Susan Rice in this scenario. But to Ooh, deny... It's getting hot in here. <laughs> yeah. It's a July Day Friday. Friday. Yeah. 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 Clinton did it a lot. Yeah. 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 David is right. We're not going to get any answers from this hearing, A, behind, because it's behind closed doors, but B, because it's going to be up to the interpretation of the senators who are there. So obviously the folks yeah. in her party are going to be supportive of her rationale yeah. for unmasking. And in the opposing party, they're going to be critical. So we come out where we start. All right. With the Democratic Party struggling to find a way forward after a string of special election losses, word former President Obama may be coming to the rescue behind the scenes. Would that be a good idea? We will surely debate that next. At Boat Towns in Nissan, our friendly staff will help you find the right Nissan at the right price. Like the 2017 Nissan Rogue, only $139 a month for 36 months. At Boat Towns in Nissan, it's all about you. Visit online at btnissan.com. After losing the White House and a series of special elections since, Democrats are trying to plot a new path forward. Now there's a report out that says President Obama is taking on a larger role in his party's strategy, mostly behind the scenes. There's a piece in The Hill that says, quotes the former president as saying, while he plans to provide space for new leadership in the party to step in, he also wants to be an available resource for those drafting the Democratic message. The conversations between Obama and the lawmakers and party leaders are said to vary. With Perez, the men discuss the outlines of the party's future, while with others, he's focused more on policy. So I want to go to David first on this. Um, what do you think about President Obama assuming this messaging role behind the scenes. Is that a good place for him to be at in the terms of he did a pretty good job of messaging for his own campaign, right? Isn't he the right person to step in and help the Dems now? It's a good spot for Republicans. No president, <laughs> no president can Ouch. match President Obama's record at endorsing candidates who ultimately go on to lose. And as GOPAC chairman and the one helping to lead the efforts to stop President Obama in this effort, I say we welcome his uh, involvement. And uh, it's going to make it harder for Jessica and her team. Wow. I think there's pretty broad consensus among the American people that President Obama's campaign messaging was a lot better than the governing messaging. For himself. So isn't, Dagan, what do you think? Is, is he really going to help with the camp? We're camp Dems are in campaign mode. Right. So isn't he the right person to do this or he still no? I think that his greatest asset is he, him as a messenger, not the actual message, oh. that it's his 
and he's quite frankly very charming and very easygoing on the campaign trail. He's a great speaker. He has great comic timing, and that has always worked for him. And so he can craft the best message on planet Earth. But if you have someone delivering it who squawks at you like a pterodactyle, <laughs> nobody is going to listen. I'm sorry. Who are you talking about? And I think again? yeah, that's a remark about female candidates and some male candidates as well. But I think that, I, again, it's it's why you saw in Britain, Theresa May didn't do that well. It's just because of the per because of the personality, quite But frankly. there's something missing from that, the whole announcement that he's going to be doing this is what is the message he's going to be brought in to sell? He's the great order. What is, it, what is he going to be selling? Democrats haven't figured that out yet. I don't they? think that they have either. Jessica, what, you're probably oh, don't the best. Me. Yeah. You, uh, well, what, okay, someone say, text me the answer. What if, real you were, <laughs> what if you had a chance to craft the messaging? What would for 2018? What would the focus be? Like, what what's the top issue? I, well, I certainly think the economy, and it is absolutely not. We're just not Donald Trump. I think that is a non-starter. Not necessarily because people will turn out. For well, how Donald are you going to do that when the economy is? turning around under Trump. Well, I, listen, there are a lot of gains that were made under the Obama administration. Donald Trump's even had to admit it. I mean, he's unemployment now, it's down to 4.3. He took over at 4.8. We had, what, over 60 months straight of private sector job growth. There are a lot of things you can talk about, but also people just don't want to be lectured. And I think that that's what has gone wrong for people on the local level, state and national level even. Um, but I think that Democrats really have to pose a hopeful, positive economic message and a lot about the American dream and restoring that. I've well, been looking at the data. Uh, I have a couple of, talking to, of the, actually talking to people who live between Washington, D.C. Well, and they California. Just, they, they, do, yeah. they do that. And, and and Joe Biden will be great for that. And there are a lot of people like the Tim Ryans of the world who are coming up. But I think that President Obama playing a role on this is important. Uh, but he, he obviously can't help everyone in his office. I'm going to yeah. jump in. More outnumbered in just a moment. We'll be right back.